Welcome to the pulmonary diagnostics. So um, you will be asked to recall information from regular diagnostics on pulmonary function testing. So that includes your flows, your volumes, um, looking at FEV 1%. So all those things you will be asked to remember or at least read again in your book and understand the information. With this lecture, we're going to go more in deep on uh, the different types of specialized tests that pulmonary uh, function testing uh, labs will usually do and so that way we can sort of see and dive deeper into the subject without rediscovering stuff that you guys uh, had down at one point. Uh, so just please take some time, refresh yourself on the basics of pulmonary function testing, volumes, flow rates, and interpreting obstructive versus restrictive versus combined. Um, that's something that I expect you to understand and know coming into this course because you guys have already gone through that in Diagnostics 1. So if you are still uh, needing a refresher on that, please go back through your reading material and or your old notes on that information. But let's get started on this one. So let's talk about quality control. The reason why I want to talk about quality control on this and make a big point of it uh, on the board exam, uh, you're going to have questions about quality controlling and calibrating equipment. And this is going to be an area that you're not going to have too many questions on. But when you do have a question on it, you want to get it right because that means you have more of a buffer for other areas of the exam. So don't just gloss over this area. This is actually an area that could come in very handy very quickly as far as the board exams are concerned. Um, so when we're calibrating spirometers, and usually they're using a pneumotechometer, uh, when we're calibrating spirometers, you're using that 3 liter super syringe traditionally. And what we're going to do is we're going to use that 3 liter super syringe and we're going to do the super syringe at a slow, medium, and fast rate at that three liters. And so we're trying to look at calibration of both flow rates and volumes, right? So that's why we're going to do a slow flow rate, a medium flow rate, and a faster flow rate. Uh, this was a question at finals for Speed Bowl last year, so something to pay attention to. Um, so make sure you do slow, medium, and fast flow rates. We're using that 3 liter super syringe. And what we're doing is we're looking at the calibration factors. The calibration factor is just the equation of the expected volume, which in this case is... 3 liters over the measured volume, which in this case is 3 liters, right? So that's what we're looking at here. So it should have a 3% accuracy. So if you're not good with percentages, uh, then you want anywhere between 2.91 and 3.09 liters, right? That's considered calibrated. It sounds like this might be an important thing to remember, just saying. Uh, when we're looking at this, you need to understand if it's within calibration or if it's outside. So what's the danger? If you don't calibrate the equipment the day of a pulmonary function test, you do a pulmonary function test, and there's no calibration done for that day, well, there's a lot of factors that could play into a role where that patient may be misdiagnosed with their severity of their condition, especially if the flow rate was off or the volumes were off, something like that was off with that patient's uh, pulmonary function exam. So it can be very serious consequences if you don't make sure that equipment is calibrated. So every day that the PFT equipment is used, we had to calibrate it, right? We had to go in at the beginning of the day and we would do our at least flow test with the three liter super syringe, right? So many of fast and that would show it's within calibration, that it's accurate and therefore uh, the values that we would get would be reliable. And so that's why it's important, right? We want to make sure that our patients have that uh, evaluation so that way that we know that they're getting the right diagnosis, the right severity, um, and the right types of medication uh, process for the severity of their disease. So three speeds, slow, medium, and fast. Um, you should have the same readout for each test as long as the user error isn't a part of it. Uh, you want to do it at least once a day. 
that it's being used. So let's say it's Christmas Day and no no one's coming in for the pulmonary function test. Do you have to do it? Well, that's up to the individual hospitals. But if we're not doing any testing that day or um, we're not planned to do any testing that day, then we would not do it. So each hospital might vary for that. But uh, if you're going to test any patients, uh, then you need to make sure it's within calibration that day. Uh, biologic controls are something else that we can use. Uh, this is something that usually we do with each other, right? The PFT lab people. Uh, we, uh, I would go in there and do a PFT on myself or someone else in the PFT lab would do a PFT on me and I would do a PFT on them. And we'd use that as a quality control. And that way we can sort of see, not only that, but it allowed us to practice our coaching. It allows us to understand what the patient's going through a little bit better. So it's pretty it's a pretty good idea to use just that biologic control, especially for things like DLCOs and things like that. It's pretty interesting. Plus, if you have something like asthma yourself, it's pretty nice to actually get a uh, free PFT done. So, you know, bonus. All right. So the first specialized test we'll talk about is the body box, right? Hence the cool pictures, right? The body box, body plasmography, we're looking at mouth pressure transducer, the box pressure transducer, and a flow transducer. So these are your transducers that you're using to measure pretty much volumes and capacities as well as flow rates, okay? So if we know the box pressure and we know the mouth pressure, right, then pressure and volume vary inversely. This is all whose law. If pressure and volume vary inversely, Whose law is this? Temperature is a constant, mass is a constant here, right? That's Boyle's law, right? So this whole thing works off of Boyle's law. If we know the pressure in the box and we know the pressure at the mouth, the difference between the two would be the volume. So we could actually look at total lung capacity with a body box test because we're looking, we're just using Boyle's law here, right? And that's something that we could actually look and we take your vital capacity minus your total lung capacity, right? If I take TLC, total lung capacity, and I subtract my vital capacity, right? If I'm subtracting this, what would be left over? Hopefully you guys remember this. You do need to know this, right? Then I can figure out what their residual volume is. I can see how much trapped gas there is on this patient. And this is something, especially for people with obstructive lung disease, we can trend how bad the residual volume, how much the residual volume is increasing over time. What about ILD? Right? What about interstitial lung diseases? What about pulmonary fibrosis? Right? I can actually trend over time if the residual volume keeps decreasing and by how much. Right? So this is actually a good indicator on the severity of their disease process and it can help us trend and quantify it a lot more accurately than just looking at symptoms alone. So the body box can be very, very useful. This is one way we can look at uh, total lung capacity. So we're looking, we have the mouth pressure transducer, the box pressure transducer, and the flow transducer, which is the pneumotech that's in there. All right, so there are more specialized testing. There's pre and post bronchodilator testing. We are talking about that in Diagnostics 1. And the idea here between pre and post bronchodilator testing is to look for reactivity or response to the therapy if someone's bronchoreactive, right? And the whole idea is, as far as diagnosis is concerned, is not only do we want to see the FPV1 improve by at least 12%, absolutely 12 to 20%, depending on your source, but we also want to see if they're reactive to the medicine. So let's say someone's wheezing and we give them a bronchodilator and their wheezing doesn't respond. Well, that's great, but we don't know how much of a change there was, if any at all. So if we do a pre and post bronchodilator testing, we can numerically see if there was a change and is it significant. And if there wasn't a significant change, then we know that we need to look for diagnoses or other alternatives um, like an aorta that's pressing on their trachea, right? We can look for other uh, other things that could be causing their wheezing besides bronchospasm. I hope that makes sense to you. So pre and post bronchodilator testing not only looks at their response to it, but also if there is a response or isn't response will help us in the decision tree of uh, yes, there's a response, so yes, there's something causing bronchospasm, 
or no, there's not a response, and it might be something anatomical. Maybe we want to order like a CT scan and look at anatomy, or maybe we want to order a bronch and then look look manually at what could be causing the, that restricted airway. If it's not showing up on an x-ray or CT scan, it might not be radiopaque, and therefore we might not see it unless we do things like a bronchoscopy. So this is going to be a pretty important test for you overall, not just if they respond to bronchodilators or not, but also it can tell us uh, which decision tree to use ultimately. Methicoline challenges. Great to look at uh, reactive airways. We'll talk about that. The PD-20 and all that stuff. DLCOs, very important, especially with cancer care and chemotherapy, uh, right? Because one of the big things when you're doing things like chemotherapy is you're giving a toxic drug uh, to the body, and one of the th air, one of the tissues that's affected by this is your uh, lungs, right? And so what happens here is that chemotherapy uh, can cause scarring of your lung tissue ultimately and decrease your diffusion because right you have your uh, alveoli and here's your capillary right and if we're scarring this alveoli we're going to make it a lot harder for oxygen to diffuse into the tissue and so we can actually do this to look at their baseline before they start chemotherapy as well as during chemotherapy to sort of help titrate the strength of chemotherapy. So it's kind of an interesting thing. We would do this with uh, GBM patients, glioblastoma meningiomas, like our brain cancer patients, things like that. So people that don't even have a lung condition, so to speak, you might be doing a PFT on them for things like chemotherapy. So DLCOs can be very important, especially when you're looking at things like emphysema, uh, ILDs, good pasture syndrome. Uh, it can tell us how much bleeding into the lungs there is. It's pretty interesting stuff. Uh, Aero resistance, we'll talk a lot about this, especially if someone has a obstructive condition going on or uh, including things like a tracheal tumor, right? Including something that's in the airway that's obstructing the airway. Uh, that can actually sort of trend to see if it's growing or if it's staying put. It can actually help us look at other things too, like vocal cord dysfunction, uh, floppy airways, things like that. So raw can be pretty useful um, evaluation for our patients. Compliance studies, we'll talk about that using the esophageal balloons. Closing volumes, we'll talk a little bit about closing volumes. Uh, not done as much anymore, but that's something I just want you to have in case you are asked about them. And then exercise testing, we've already talked about exercise testing a little bit here. And exercise testing, we didn't really talk about it much there. Uh, looking for things like vocal cord dysfunction and that can be one way that we sort of tease out exercise-induced bronchospasm or exercise-induced asthma versus something like VCD, right? So this is pretty cool. And National Duos does a lot of this where they'll actually put a Larry in a, a patient. Patient's wearing a helmet. They have a Larry that's looking at their vocal cords while they're on a stationary bike, right, the cycle ergometer. And they can actually sort of see what's going on there. It's a pretty cool thing overall so uh, there's a lot of interesting aspects to the pulmonary function lab it's not all just hey or blow into this machine right that's there's way more to it and there's more tests than this that they do over there right they do phenos they do forced oscillation there's a bunch of other things that they do in the pulmonary lab and this is only just a small snippet of all the really neat things that they do over there so if you're ever interested it's a great uh, the other advantage of working PFT it's not a lot of blood and guts and sometimes maybe that's not the worst thing in the world to have a little bit uh, healthier patients or patients you can have conversations with and not have to worry from running to patient to patient to patient all the time so uh, hopefully I'm selling you or just opening up your mind a little bit that that is a possible avenue that actually might not be the worst thing in the world so all right let's talk about pre and post tests we already talked about how this can be significant if they have reactivity or not. And that's the big thing we're looking at. Are they reactive or not, right? What Are we ruling out anything anatomical as far as like an aorta or a tumor or something like that pressing against something that could cause a wheeze that won't go away, right? So pre and post bronchodilator will not only see how effective it is, but also help us in that decision tree of diagnostics. So when you give this, you're just looking at usually pre and post vital capacities. Remember to give it time for the bronchodilators to work and that will change.
with different hospital policies. Some hospital policies say at least 10 minutes for the bronchodilators pre and post. Other ones will say 15 to 20 minutes. So you just have to pay attention to that facility and their recommendations. Uh, the big thing here that you will also be looking for is reversibility. And that's what most people see the test for is how reversible is it? Is this sort of like their constant baseline state or are they severe enough right now where they could use bronchodilators on a more regular basis like at home? So if it does help, then they might need more use of it at home, like using a beta-2 sympathomimetic at home. Or um, now newer evidence is coming out, and so you'll have to check this on your own. Um, as of recording this, newer evidence is coming out of using inhaled corticosteroids in the asthmatic uh, population, not just the COPD population. But um, So that might be something that indicated that they might want to start something like inhaled corticosteroids at home so that's a whole separate area but that's just me adding some side notes to this um, so when you're looking at this you're looking at the fev1 and the fef forced expiratory flow 25 to 75 percent remember this represents the medium to small airways if you remember right and the fev1 and the fev1 percent is where we take the fev1 over the fbc So what percent of the, the expiratory volume is exhaled in that first second, right? And remember, we want over 75% of it exhaled in that first second, at least. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we'll be looking at is their flow rates here. And not only what their baseline flow rate is, but how much change there is after we give them a bronchodilator, right? And so the FEF 25 to 75 is the, the medium to small airways. So that'll give us even more hints on how effective is this at the airways that are most changed by bronchospasm. So remember, your large conducting airways are most have a lot of cartilage in them, right? So your trachea, your main stem, your segments, your subsegments, so right? all those those airways, those conducting airways have a lot of cartilage in them, right? There's the cartilaginous layer of the tracheobronchial tree. When you get to the respiratory zone, right, those medium to small airways, when you start to get into the closer that transition to respiratory zone, the only thing that's keeping those structured is actually the smooth muscle on the outside, right? You still have the lamina propria and all that stuff on the outside, but you're you're looking at the muscle, that smooth muscle giving it structure. So which airways do you think are going to be most closed off or most affected by bronchospasm? Well, it's going to be my medium to small airways. It's not going to be my large conducting airways. So that's why we're going to pay close attention to that FEF 25 to 75 percent. Remember, when we're looking at that flow volume loop, that's that scoop that you'd see right? That 25 to 75 is looking at that middle 50% of that exhaled breath. Sorry, I didn't close the loop there. But that's what you're looking at is that scoop for the small airways. Those are usually most affected by the bronchospasm. It's not as much the large airways because they have that scaffolding of the cartilage. So usually we're going to do a flow volume study, right? We're going to make them do a force vital capacity traditionally. And then we're going to look at the reversibility by doing uh, another one after the bronchodilators had a chance to take effect. So we'll do the bronchodilator study. Uh, we're going to make sure we get at least two to three uh, measurements that uh, increase in order to show reactivity on the post one. So you want to make sure you get two or three pre and two or three post, uh, but we want to make sure that two or three post show have to show that increase. So the vital capacity must increase by more than 10%. FEV1 by 15% in 25 to 75 by at least 20%. So 12 to 15% for your FEV1 is what you're ultimately looking at for diagnosing reactivity. So I hope that sort of makes sense.
Pre and post, they're useful with asthmatics. That's the that's the perfect uh, situation that we're looking for there. They're not very useful with patients that have um, COPD because their 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 pulmonary function tests in, in emphysema, chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis, uh, so on and so forth. It it can change from day to day, uh, depending on a multitude of factors, especially with their secretions if they have chronic bronchitis on top of their um, emphysema, right? So um, we usually we're gonna give bronchodilators anyway to patients that have COPD because they have shortness of breath, because they might have that bronchospasm component with their COPD. So we'll still use them. And like I said, some of the big advantages of using it in patients that aren't asthmatic is we can still rule out uh, what level of this is reversible and what level of it is not reversible with COPD. Now remember, COPD has that, uh, the, remember the Venn diagram from a uh, disease class where it had, um, I'm terrible at drawing these things. Uh, we have uh, emphysema, asthma, chronic bronchitis, right? So we have these things. And so the big thing, you will have bronchospasm with all three of these, or you can have bronchospasm with all three of these. But we're going to we're gonna have minute differences between these two. And so asthma might be a component of chronic bronchitis or emphysema. So when we're doing this on someone that has COPD, we might say, hey, what, how much of this is effectively asthma? How much of this condition or how much of what's currently going on with this patient is bronchospasm or re reversible airway? Because remember, emphysema is irreversible, right? Asthma is defined as being reversible, right? So one's irreversible, one's reversible. So how much of their disease process on the COPD patient well, how much of their COPD process is reversible? How much of it is asthma is what we're looking at here. Um, and so it can still be helpful in COPD patients. Primarily, it's done for the asthmatic component. Methicoline challenges, these were my least favorite one to do, not because of any particular thing, just because I was reactive to the methicoline, and so I would always have a bronchospasm while performing this. So I think nowadays you you youngins are going to have a lot better time because there's a lot better protocols in place to protect the provider administering this test. Oh, lucky ducks, you. All right, so methicoline has parasympathomimetic properties. Not lytic, but mimetic. We're purposely going to cause a bronchospasm. So that's pretty important to understand, which means if you're going to do this test, you might want to have a bronchodilator handy or in the room with a nebulizer right in the room ready to go to reverse them if their bronchospasm gets severe enough. You're going to do the opposite of what your profession has trained you to do, right? So far we've trained you to reverse bronchospasm. Now you're giving a medicine that will cause bronchospasm, right? So it's sort of counterintuitive to be like, here I'm going to give you something that's going to make you worse on purpose, right? Uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit, but just make sure you have bronchodilator and a method of administering that bronchodilator handy when you're doing this test. You, you'll thank me later for that one. Uh, so parasympathomimetic properties, so it's going to cause bronchospasm. So uh, it's more that it's going to cause bronchospasm on people that are sensitive to it, right? So if you already have reactive airways, you're going to be reactive to it. That's the whole idea. So it may cause bronchospasm when, when inhaled. Some patients, what I remember doing this test on, and they wouldn't have a response at all. We'd go to the strongest dose, and they wouldn't respond at all. Like they, their FEV1 wouldn't drop hardly at all, if at all. And so it was pretty straightforward that they did not have a reactive airway component. And so there, the, the physician was more trying to rule out a reactive airway component. So we're seeing if their lungs are reactive, how reactive are they? How ha hyper responsive are they? How sensitive, how severe is their reaction?
I hope that makes sense. How severe is their reaction? If they do have it, how severe it is. And that's why we do the different doses to look at the severity of all of this. Um, so after each dose of methicolin, you're going to do FEV1 until you see the FEV1 decrease by 20%. Then the test is positive. They've hit their PD20 um, provocative dose of 20%. They've dropped 20% from their baseline. And now you're going to give them reversing agents like bronchodilators and that's and then until they're back to their baseline so you'll do um the the bronchodilator administration and then you'll let it sort of take effect and then you'll do another uh, the fev um, procedure and then hopefully they're back to their baseline if not you might have to give them more bronchodilator the idea is to reverse them before you let them get discharged from the hospital because you don't want them like collapsing in the parking lot of the hospital. That would be horrendous, right? So they cannot leave unless they're reversed. If we cannot reverse them in the PFT lab, they might have to be admitted to the emergency department until they are reversed, which would be sad. I never had to do that. Um, I know it does happen, but uh, we... we we were usually able to get them reversed. I never had a case where I, I didn't let someone go and had to get them down to the ER. Uh, uh, so when we uh, decrease by 20%, it's a positive test, so they have hyperreactivity. And then we look at what dose it took them to become positive, and that sort of looks at the level of reactivity or the, the sensitivity level of their airway. So the environment should be safe. Make sure you have your bronchodilator handy once again important thing sounds like I could ask you about that in a situation what would who, what would you want to have handy with you right so make sure you have that ready to go uh, make sure also especially if someone's hyper reactive uh, make sure you know where your code card is that should go without saying but I will say it anyway you should know where your code card and all your uh, airway equipment is if this patient does go into an emergency pretty quickly so this is the dosing schedule. So the first dose, and we don't tell them that, uh, the first dose is going to be normal saline. It's sort of like a placebo or a baseline effect. It shouldn't have too much effect on bronchospasm. Now understand, when you're looking at um, almost any medicine can cause irritation to the airway. So if you look in the physician's desk reference on something like albuterol, like I challenge you, pause the video and look at the PDR for albuterol. And if one of the hazards is should say on there bronchospasm of some sort or bronchoconstriction of some sort. Anything that goes into the lungs, no matter what it is, even if it's a bronchodilator, can cause irritation and subsequently cause bronchospasm. So in theory, normal saline shouldn't do that as because um, it's isotonic, right, and all that stuff. It should just sort of hydrate. And that's sort of like a placebo as well. It's a way to sort of see effort also uh, so there's a lot of good hints that the normal saline dose can give you but it's not something that you're going to advertise to the patient that that is what they're doing then you're going to progressively give them larger and larger doses and then at some point here you might see hey their their fev1 dropped by 20 percent then we're going to stop the procedure altogether and then reverse them Right. The idea is how strong, how much it took, or did they go through the whole thing, like 25 milligrams per mil, and not have a bronchospasm at all, right? So that's sort of that dosing procedure. Uh, we never had to mix this up, thank goodness. Uh, there was beautiful people in pharmacy. I love the pharmacy people uh, that mixed this up for us and labeled it, and it was amazing. <laughs> so the PD20, the provocative dose 20, is a dose at which the FEV1 will fall by 20% from their baseline. So you're going to do a baseline, and then you're going to do normal saline, and then you're going to do progressively higher doses. Hyperreactive airways usually uh, have at least 5 milligrams per mil or less. So hopefully, like going back to that last slide, if you go back to that last slide, you'll see... Um, that that is pretty hyper reactive um, if they're five milligrams or less. Now a lot of people, even if they're not considered hyper reactive, might still respond at higher doses. But we're just trying to see how sensitive they are. So that's usually the big area that we're looking at. Where were they at at that dose? So things to withhold prior to uh, doing this test: uh, adrenergics, anticholinergics. 
Uh, Theophilus, they're on it. Now, understand, people are still on Xanthines out there. So you got to be careful, especially your severe asthmatics. And most of the time, if they're already diagnosed with asthma and it's severe, they're not going to be in your PFT lab for a methicoline challenge. Usually they're doing something else in there. But um, if someone's on theophylline, they want to hold that. Um, Intol, antihistamines, caffeine for at least six hours. Remember, caffeine is a xanthine, right? Uh, don't withhold corticosteroids. Remember, corticosteroids, inhaled corticosteroids, take up to four weeks to be start being effective like building up in your lungs and then do you seeing it 12 to 24 hours um beforehand really isn't going to do much because it's built up sort of that coating or it's built up that level in your lung tissue and so withholding it even a day or a week ahead of time is still going to sort of be a little off and a lot of times we're using this for general control of the condition so withholding uh corticosteroids usually won't benefit much of anything now a physician here and there may want to that's up to them right but just in general uh corticosteroids are not something you would want want to withhold i will repeat that again just in general corticosteroids are not something you would want to withhold prior to this testing uh, beta blockers might increase the response uh, so you got to be careful so if they're on beta blockers remember beta blockers is an anti hypertensive medicine it's for high blood pressure right they also use it for things like anxiety and stuff as well to slow down the heart rate to decrease blood pressure so that way your anxiety symptoms won't cause you to black out or anything like that um, so beta blockers might increase the response of this. In other words, they might be more hyper reactive. And that's why we ask what their current medicines are. And then we take note of that in the chart. So when the physician's interpreting this and they can look at their history physical, that you've, you've written down the questionnaire or they've written down what medicines they're on. If they're on a beta blocker, then they know to have that in mind with this study. Okay, so on to DLCOs. I love DLCOs. Um, they were one of our most uh, valuable measurements because we did a lot of patients with uh, glioblastoma and meningiomas. Or, uh, so we do a lot of the DLCOs specifically looking at titrating chemotherapy drugs. So this was a test that was stressed uh, in, our, in the pulmonary function lab that I would participate in. It was stressed for our patients a lot. So uh, this I think is going to be a pretty valuable information uh, for a lot of different scenarios besides GBMs, right? So we're looking at the function of the capillary bed in contact with the alveoli. We want to see what's going on with the diffusion of gas across the membrane into the bloodstream, right? Pretty straightforward. We want to see how hard it is to get oxygen into the bloodstream from the alveoli. So when we're doing this, you have the patient inhale a known concentration of carbon monoxide. It's a very small dose, right? Very, very small dose, and we'll get to the dose in a second here. And then you're going to inhale, take a deep breath, inhale, and then we're going to hold that breath for about 10 seconds or so, and then let it out. That breath hold or that pause is going to give the the gas a chance to diffuse. It's going to give it a chance to go through your conducting airways, make it into your respiratory zone, and then once in the respiratory zone, get a chance to go across into the bloodstream. So we need that breath hold, right? That's going to help. And we're looking at the ability to exchange gas in the blood. Well, uh, another advantage here is if we know a patient's pulmonary function test, let's say we have a patient, they're, 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 the physician believes they might have emphysema, but they're unsure. Like They wanted a, a, a more definitive way to diagnose them and quantify it. Then they order PFT and we do a DLCO, and let's say the DLCO is normal. Well, with emphysema, the DLCO is not normal. The DLCO is low. So then we might be looking at airway reactivity. Right, so then we might be looking at more of an asthmatic type type situation than an emphysematic type situation. So this is the only disease 
the, uh, the only obstructive disease out there that has a low DLCO is emphysema. So when you do a PFT and you see all the flow rates are low, well, what makes that different from asthma? What makes emphysema different from asthma if all the flow rates are low in both of those? So the only way to tell the difference between emphysema and asthma on a pulmonary function test is to perform a DLCO. If the DLCO is low, then I know it's emphysema because I destroyed a bunch of lung tissue, right? It's like Swiss cheese. It just destroys capillaries and lung tissue altogether, right? It's a necrotizing type situation. Not a truly necrotizing, but a necrotizing-like situation where it just destroys tissue, right? It bursts capillaries. It destroys tissue. And so their DLC will... DLCO will be low with emphysema, and then if their DLCO is normal, then we know it's not. It's pretty straightforward there. So we want to see how much of the carbon monoxide diffused across. According to Egan's, um, your Egan's book, remember carbon monoxide diffuses 200 times uh, faster uh, than oxygen. Uh, if you're looking at your uh, Disjardin's pulmonary AMP book, it says 210 times more. And I believe if you look at your Pillbeam mechanical ventilation book, it says 240 to 250 times more, um, somewhere in that area, more affinity across the AC, uh, alveolar capillary membrane. So what we're going with uh, is usually the Egan's to Disjardin's that 200 to 210 times more to cross that membrane. Uh, so if a patient has a restrictive issue uh, like pulmonary fibrosis, right? Remember pulmonary fibrosis, we got like a bunch of scar tissue building up in the alveoli. So it's going to be a big barrier for that oxygen to pass. And so we were going to see a decrease in DLCO. So we had the patient inhale the no, a known concentration, hold their breath, and then we exhale. And we measure how much carbon monoxide they exhaled versus carbon monoxide that they inhaled. So I'm going to just subtract inhaled from exhaled to get how much is missing. And how much is missing is what got diffused, right? If I inhale a certain concentration of carbon monoxide and I exhale the exact same amount, my diffusion is very, very poor. So in other words, if I had good diffusion, I would inhale carbon monoxide and I would exhale hardly any of it. So that's what we're looking at here. How easily did that carbon monoxide get from inside the lungs to inside the bloodstream? The less we see come back, the better the diffusion, right? So in patients with restrictive issues, a low DLCO is constant, uh, consistent with an ILD, interstitial lung disease. So this does not diagnose them with a specific ILD. Remember, to get a specific ILD, they either need a high-res CT scan um, with good, good valuation there, or in open lung biopsy, which is still by many considered very, very much more accurate. Uh, in patients with obstructive impairments, uh, the a low DLCO is what will identify emphysema spe specifically, right? And so they make a big thing there. And so this is what you're looking at here. 80 to 120% is normal, right? And they might ask you units of this. So you might ask, hey, what's the normal value of DLCO? And we'll get to it. <laughs> I believe it's 25. Um, and they like to ask you units uh, when we're looking at this. And this is just telling you how it works. So you're going to use, and this is important because they will ask you this on the board exams, and you want to get it right if that's what they're asking, a 0.3% carbon monoxide. 0.3% carbon monoxide. Don't say 3%. Don't say 0.03%. Don't say 0 0.003, get it mixed up with the CaO2, right? Say 0.3% carbon monoxide for this, right? It also has a little bit of helium, oxygen, and then the rest of it's nitrogen, right? You can do the math there um, when we're looking at this. So that's why those tanks have all those little dots of different colors on them. Usually they're like brown tanks that with all these different colored dots. So it's showing that's a mix, mixed gas cylinder and that's what we're using so the patient inhales from this cylinder right to a valve they'll inhale it has a sampler that looks at 
the concentration, but they'll inhale through the sampler, the gas, they'll hold it, there'll be a shutter, and then they'll exhale, and then we'll measure that what is exhaled back through this analyzer. So they inhale from the gas, they exhale to the analyzer, we compare what was given versus what was exhaled. Right, and the, one of the big things here, it depends on the determinants of gas exchange depend on uh, the diffusion of the coefficient of the gas, which we have a known in this situation, so that's not something you'll have to worry about usually. The surface area, the membrane, that's one of the big areas, right, with emphysema or with, with a necrotizing pneumonia. We can actually see how much surface area has been destroyed. The thickness of the membrane, because the DLCO would be reduced, in other words, we didn't get much diffusion. Um, the pulmonary volume and flow, so that's going to be something where we'll still do a regular pulmonary function test on these patients. So we know if that's a factor or not. The gas distribution, hopefully you're coaching this, get a good respiratory effort. And of course the hematocrit. Now this is one of the situations where it depends on the facility. You're going to have to somehow check their hematocrit. Now we had a Rainbow 7 um, from Massimo that looked at their hematocrit level. So it was a non-invasive non-invasive way to look at that and that thing looks at coaxymetry as well so that's why we could look at it there too and look at the carbon monoxide levels in their blood pretty useful thing and uh, or they can come in and have a lab drawn and run their hematocrit that way but that's going to be important because if their hematocrit's low then their DLCO will be low and it's not low because their fusion maybe it is but their diffusion might be low because they just have low red blood cells. They have low hematocrit to begin with. Um, they have low hemoglobin to begin with. And so that can really affect it big time. So we're going to use small levels, right? So we're, do you guys remember the concentration? What was the concentration of carbon monoxide? This could be a board exam question because I've seen it on the board exams of myself. So we're looking at how much of the gas enters the blood per minute, uh, sorry, per millimeter of mercury, right? Um, so ultimately we're looking at uh, milliliters per minute per mercury. Milliliters, milliliters per minute per mercury. Milliliters per minute per mercury. There was a student that recently graduated and this was one of the exact question, not exact, I can't say that. Uh, one of the questions was basically asking what the units of a DLCO was, right? And so that was something I'd stressed to the student during Sputable and asked them quite a lot. And somehow it came up in their board exams. Go figure. It's almost like I, I did something like that on purpose. Um, so when we're looking at this, make sure you take note of the units. I, I make you guys look at these things on purpose. I hope you understand that. I don't do it for my joy, which I do get joy, but uh, I do it for a purpose. Right? I want you guys to be successful. Um, so a normal value is 25. You do need to memorize this. This is information I will ask of you. Uh, normal value is 25 mils per minute per mercury. Normal is 25 mils per minute of mercury. Normal is 25 mils per minute per mercury. All right, hopefully you got that down. Uh, there is a correction that needs to be made on this slide, uh, but these are things that cause an increase in your DLCO and things that cause a decrease in your DLCO. And there's evidence to support this change, right? So I will say, uh, I'm not just making this up. It's not just my opinion. Um, obesity needs to be moved over to the DLCO column, right? All right, so with things that increase DLCO, if you're supine, that will increase your DLCO because the gas is going um, to the, those posterior sections and therefore uh, the perfusion will change and you will have an uh, increase in DLCO. Uh, people that uh, exercise, athletes have better um, pulmonary capillaries, better perfusion, better vascular uh, vascularity. Uh, uh, responsiveness to um, their blood flowing through their lungs 
more effective that would increase their DLCO. If someone's polycythemic, that will increase their DLCO. If someone has a left to right shunt, that will increase their DLCO. So what's a left to right shunt? So let's do this. Going back to cardiac, let's say someone, you have a patient that has a PFO, a patent for amino bowel, or an ASD. Okay, so with an ASD or PFO, which side of the heart, we're assuming normal pressures, we're not assuming a congenital heart defect or anything. Assuming normal pressures, which side of the adult heart has more pressure, the left side or the right side? This will be the left side, this will be the right side. So the left side has more pressure. So as far as um, oxygenated blood coming back to the left atrium, you're going to have more pressure in the left atrium versus the right atrium. So you're going to have oxygenated good blood going to the deoxygenated bad side that gets then recycled back through the lungs again. So you have what's called a left to right shunt. That's the good blood going to the bad side, which is not going to be super dangerous, but it'll increase your DLCO because now you got even more of this, um, more hemoglobin, you got more blood volume that's going back through the lungs than would be before. See, you're adding more blood to the blood flow that's going to the lungs, therefore you would increase the amount of diffusion because we're increasing pulmonary blood volume. So when we get to perinatology, we'll talk about a left to right shunts causing pulmonary edema because now we're adding extra vascular volume to blood flow that's ultimately going to the lungs. Well, what happens when you overload the lungs with blood volume or any type of volume expander, right? They're going to leak from inside the capillaries to inside the respiratory zone, right into the alveoli, and that causes your pulmonary edema, right? That frothy sputum, all that stuff. So left to right shunts are very prone to cause uh, increased blood flow to the lungs, which would then increase DLCO in that case, as well as a higher chance of causing pulmonary edema. And that pulmonary edema is more with a, a significant PFO or something like that, but something to look at. So left to right shunt, right? And a PFO is just one example of such things. Uh, DH, hopefully you guys remember what DH is, uh, especially when we talked about ARDS. D DH is diffuse alveolar hemorrhaging. That's where blood, <laughs> we'll get rid of this, right? Uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhaging is where the alveoli is literally hemorrhaging blood into the respiratory zone. This is diagnosed with bronchoscopy. Currently, it looks a lot like ARDS. Um, diagnosed with bronchoscopy, we're going to go in there. We're going to wedge the scope. We're going to do a BAL, and then we're going to look at like three subsequent uh, BAL pools, and then uh, where we want to see it get lighter or darker. If it gets darker, then we know it's diffuse alveolar hemorrhaging. So we have more red blood cells hanging out in the alveoli. Well, if there's more red blood cells in the alveoli, well, if that's going to look like the carbon monoxide got diffused, but in fact, it just attached itself to the hemoglobin, eh, that's hanging out in the alveoli. So even though their diffusion is decreased, right? Do you understand that their diffusion would be decreased because of there's blood filling up the respiratory zone? So realistically, physiologically, their diffusion is decreased. But if you're doing a PFT for some reason on a patient that has DH, their, their DLCO would in theory be normal or increased because of this red blood cells hanging out here that are making it look like we have good diffusion, but we don't. So if they made a ventilator in the future, and I hope this happens, right? I hope I'm speaking in a premonition here. Uh, if they make a ventilator in the future that does DLCOs, this would be very useful in looking at things like ARDS and DH and all these other different things. It'd be very useful uh, at the bedside to see if we have more surface area, less surface area, if, if their compliance is getting better or worse, and we can trend how much their compliance uh, is is in, in tune with their diffusion. If their diffusion is getting better, then uh, we could also see if we can step down their pulmonary pressures to avoid uh, ventilator-induced lung injury. So I am hoping that one day one of you creates a ventilator that can do this DLCO. I'm just saying.
Um, and then, of course, asthma can increase DLCL because what happens, remember, we have inflammation with asthma, and inflammation with asthma brings more blood flow, right? Inflammation brings blood flow. Have you ever sprained your ankle and a bunch of blood and stuff will pull into that area, right? That's exactly what you're looking at here. And therefore, more red blood cells equals more diffusion. Decreased DLCO. Why would I put obesity over here? And there's evidence to support this, but obesity uh, is a restrictive lung effect, right? And we're talking about significant, we're talking about morbid obesity. We're not talking 10 pounds, right? We're talking morbid obesity. And so the reason here is that it restricts lung expansion, restricts the tissue, therefore restricts the ability um, for the expanse of the tissue, therefore restricts the ability for it to uh, diffuse overall because we have less surface area. With emphysema, do you have more or less surface area? Well, you have less surface area. With pulmonary fibrosis, it's not necessarily that you lost surface area. It's that these, the surface area of the alveoli is now a bunch of scar tissue, right? And therefore, you cannot get through that scar tissue as easily. Pneumonectomy. Hey, if we get rid of surface area, do you guys sort of see a theme? <laughs> right? If the, if the capillaries, if the, if the, the alveoli is thick, or we lose surface area, the DLCO will be low, right? Pulmonary hypertension. Ooh, that doesn't make sense, because doesn't hypertension mean a lot of blood flow? No, not always, right? Pulmonary hypertension could indicate high blood flow, but let me submit this to your thought process, right? See what you guys think here. Okay, pulmonary hypertension usually is a result of hypoxic pulmonary vaso constriction. So if we vasoconstrict, right, if we go from a nice wide open blood vessel to now a very narrow blood vessel because we're hypoxic for some reason or another, sepsis, let's just say, or asthma, right, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, I don't know, right, pick something that causes hypoxemia, <laughs> right, any of the lung diseases, there you go, uh, uh, so that'll cause pu pulmonary vasoconstriction. So how many red blood cells are going through this very, very small capillary versus this very, very large area? Right, so we're actually reducing the number of red blood cells when we have pulmonary hypertension that are going through the lungs. We're reducing pulmonary blood volume and therefore a decreased DLCO. I hope that makes sense to you. So the cool thing is if we were to add nitric on this patient, in theory, if this patient has hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction because of a severe acidosis, right? Uh, and we add nitric to the case, we actually might see a relaxing of those blood vessels and therefore an improved VQ match and therefore better oxygenation on this patient. So those patients in severe ARDS that they're giving a pulmonary vasodilator to, there's evidence to support that because they would have better diffusion with better blood flow or better pulmonary blood volume. Isn't that cool? That's also the reason why giving someone a liter of fluid in a severe hypoxic episode might be helpful because we're CPAPing, we're giving more pressure to the pulmonary capillaries and therefore allowing a better VQ match and therefore allowing for better oxygenation because now we can get more red blood cells through that area to pick up oxygen and exchange a little bit of CO2. I hope that makes sense to you. All right, multiple PE is, of course, to decrease DLCO because we're decreasing perfusion. Remember, that's sort of a dead space issue there. And then bronchiolitis, obliterans, pneumonia, uh, or cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, I think it's called now, uh, that's destroying lung tissue ultimately as well. All right, two methods of testing DLCO. There's the steady state where they take several breaths at a very low concentration until they reach a steady state, sort of like a nitrogen washout to determine um, residual volume or total lung capacity. Right, so that's sort of what we're looking at there. They could do a steady state one or a single breath one. I'm more familiar with the single breath one. That's the one that we use. Remember, it uses 0.3% carbon monoxide. Uh, they hold their breath for about 10 seconds. They exhale the gas. We throw out that first liter of gas because that's mostly conducting airway stuff. So that's not something we really care about too much because it's just, it never got to the respiratory zone. It's just sort of stuck in the conducting airways. So uh, after we throw out that first liter of gas, we take our real measurement because that's stuff that's more likely to have reached 
our conducting our respiratory zone right so we want to throw out the conducting airway stuff we want to look at the respiratory zone stuff so we throw out that first liter of gas and we look at how much they inhaled which is that 0.3 percent and then how much they exhaled if there's a large gradient great there's good diffusion if there's hardly any gradient that means there's bad diffusion we got to look at what differentials could be causing it so increased DLCLs, we talked about this before, polycythemia patients, patients at high altitude that develop polycythemia, CHF patients, because remember there's a backup of blood from the left ventricle into their lungs ultimately, right? Because their end diastolic volume, right? The FRC of the heart, the end diastolic volume is pretty significant. So they keep building up, building up blood. Because remember, the heart's barely squeezing. That left ventricle is barely squeezing. So blood is just building up. So they have like an increased FRC, but in the heart, they don't call it FRC. They call it end diastolic volume. So how much is left over after a squeeze? <laughs> it's going to be higher, right? Because it's just not leaving because the heart's poor at squeezing. So blood flow is going to be sort of poor going from the atria to the ventricle. Therefore, blood flow is going to sort of have this um, backup in the lungs and that's what's going to be causing more blood volume hanging out in your lungs usually it's your left upper lobe that's the first place you'll start to hear those crackles when you're looking at that but sort of see why chf could cause this as well and of course asthma we talked about asthma with all the inflammation and blood volume that are going here decreased anemia of course that would be a very uh, likely cause that's why we do the hemoglobin right that's why we do the blood test too uh, loss of capillary bed so that includes is your bronchiolitis obliterans your cryptogenic organizing pneumonias emphysemas anything that destroys lung tissue right uh, anything that restricts lung tissue as well kyphoscoliosis um, morbid obesity things like that can easily do this uh, pneumonia can easily do that as well it's a, all these are restrictive right Failure to reach alveoli, so if they're in a severe bronchospasm, I mean severe bronchospasm, usually you're not doing this in a severe bronchospasm, but let's say one day it does happen where a ventilator can do this, uh, that could actually be a reason why it might actually be decreased instead of increased. And then you would know how severe that bronchospasm is as well. What? I love this stuff. All right, fibrotic lung disease such as sarcoidosis, very helpful in, in, in differentiating sarcoidosis. So of course, the big diagnostic test that's most helpful with sarcoidosis is going to be endobronchial ultrasound, where we actually get a sample uh, and send those to the lab. Uh, so, so side note there, but there you go. But anything that's restrictive is easily going to cause that decreased DLCO. So even something like Gambare or Myasthenia gravis, if it's affected the lungs and their ability to take a deep breath, their DLCO is going to be decreased because they're not using all their lung tissue. All right, so what makes it acceptable? What makes uh, this whole thing acceptable? So volume should be rapid, but a smooth inhalation, right? So it shouldn't be uh, a hesitation or choking, right, movement in. It should be a rapid, smooth breath in from residual volume. So you're going to have them breathe all the way out as far and as deep as they can go and once they're all the way out we're going to press a thing on the computer then they'll inhale and that's when we're giving them the, the carbon monoxide <laughs> right remember it's 0.3 percent uh so they'll take a breath in all the way we're going to throw away that first liter when we're looking at the readout because remember that's conducting airways we really care about the respiratory zone so we're going to throw out that that conducting your way and then we're going to look at the alveolar sample and see how much when they exhaled back through the machine after that breath hold they're going to hold their breath and then exhale after about 10 seconds or so and then we're going to measure that that after that first liter or so so usually we want to make sure they took a good breath with this otherwise they can alter the results uh, so you can actually cheat this if you wanted to but i won't you guys can figure that out on your own, but uh, uh, we need to make sure they're at least 90% of their documented vital capacity. We need to make sure it's a good effort uh, that they did a good breath hold. Usually 9 to 11 seconds is what they say. Um, two or more tests done. We want to make sure to wait four minutes. We want to make sure to wait four minutes. We want to make sure to wait four minutes. 
you want to wait four minutes in between tests to allow for the carbon monoxide to sort of go through the system. So it sounds like I want you to know this. Okay. Uh, the average must be within 10% of each other to sort of see it. Um, but remember, you have to little, set a little timer for four minutes in between each one of these tests. Make sure it's a good effort as well. All right. Moving on to raw uh, measurements, uh, this is one where you see the patient pant on the PFT machine with their hands over their their um, cheeks, uh, and that's where that shutter is closed, and it's going to feel weird, um, but we're looking at their air resistance. This is very helpful with obstructive disease patients. Um, so we're looking at the change in pressure over the change in flow. Of course, you know this equation from mechanical ventilation. What are the odds? Only we don't have to intubate our patients to check it. <laughs> yes, advantage PFT lab. All right, so we're looking at atmospheric pressure minus alveolar pressure over the flow rate is realistically what we're looking at here in the PFT lab. We're usually using the body box here for this one. So it varies inversely with lung volume. So as lung volume increases, error resistance falls. As lung volume decreases, air resistance rises. So that means if you have someone, uh, let's just say these are normal lungs here, and then you have someone that with restrictive lungs, the restrictive lungs are going to have a lot higher air resistance. So as someone's lung compliance decreases, their raw will increase. I hope that makes sense, right? That's what I'm showing here. Big lungs, to small lungs. If you're going this direction, your compliance is decreased and your raw is increased. Okay, so that's what you're seeing here with that lung compliance change or that lung volume change. So let's say their lung volumes improve, well, their raw should decrease. Why is this? Because there's more pressure, there's more alveolar elastic pressure. Remember, elasticity is the ability of a rubber band to go back to its small original state. So elasticity is the ability for something to snap back to its original state. Well, the, the lower the lung compliance, the more elastic the lungs are. And therefore, you're gonna create more turbulent flow. And remember, turbulent flow, according to Posey's law, create, uh, according to Posey's law, turbulent flow is slow and it creates um, error resistance because that, those molecules are just bouncing off of a very small container. So understand this, uh, with uh, people that have restrictive processes, you will see that um, trend. All right, so this is a picture directly from your book. Don't you love these pictures? They make perfect sense. But this is looking at the box pressure, the mouth pressure, and the flow. These are the three things, right? We talked about this. We know the box pressure, we know the mouth pressure, and then we know the flow, which is the pneumotech, right? So those are the three things we're looking at. We know the box pressure because we'll close the door on them, pretend we can't hear them, pretend we, we don't know where the key is and the door, right? No, don't do that. So we know the box pressure, uh, we know the mouth pressure, and then we know the flow rate. And so we just compare, remember, the change in pressure between their mouth and the atmosphere right and then over the flow rate and that's what we're looking at here so we have this little shutter and you see this picture here right it has this dotted line here right and so that's that shutter that closes and so they pant like a against that closed shutter and we're just comparing their mouth pressure to the box pressure and the flow rate to look at their air resistance right so this is it's very similar to what you're doing with a mechanical ventilator when you're looking at air resistance on a mechanical ventilator, right? You're looking at their tidal volume over their either their peak minus their uh, uh, plat or their plateau minus their peak if we're looking at static lung compliance. So you're looking at that. Um, so that's sorry, that's compliance. So you're looking at their pressure over their flow rate, right? And so you're trying to see that that change overall. So the patient will pant a couple of breaths, and this is going to create that S-shaped curve that you sort of seen on that previous graph. Um, and that's going to look at the slope that we'll target uh, on there. And when they're doing this, like I said, that shutter in the box will close. And you do need to know which procedures require the shutter closing. I will ask you that. So please read the chapters. All right. So this patient is still panting, usually with their hands over their cheeks to avoid the cheeks from going out. 
and causing any difference there. And we're going to look at the box pressure and the mouth pressure that's plotted against each other. That's why we have this whole S thing that's created. And from there, we can calculate their error resistance. Right, and this is just a different picture, and I believe this one is also from the book. But yeah, this is the, the change in pressure over the flow rate. And that's where we're looking at airway pressure versus the box pressure. They call it the chamber in this situation. So the box pressure versus the airway pressure or mouth pressure. All right, so we're looking at mouth versus the box. And then that little shutter will close. They'll pant against it for a couple of breaths. And that will give us uh, something that we can measure as far as the error resistance. So we don't have to intubate them to look at their raw. We can look at it right there. So volume changes in the thoracic pressure in the chamber. So as you take a deep breath in, your, your, your thorax should change in the chamber. And so that's going to change the chamber pressure. Alveolar pressure will have zero airflow when the, the shutter drops. So then we'll have zero airflow. And then we're just looking at the flow pretty much in the pneumotac. And the pneumotac will tell us uh, what's going on with their flow rates there. So a normal value, according to uh, Wilkins here, is 0.5 to 3 centimeters of water per liter per second. Uh, with your Disjardin's book, it's 0.5 to 1.5 centimeters of water per liter per second. But remember, this is for spontaneous breathing patients. Now, for intubated patients with an artificial airway, or not for trached patients with an artificial airway, but for spontaneously breathing individuals right and so we're going to uh, measure the standard flow rate and then we're going to see what percent of their their raw is of normal things that increase air resistance of course pulmonary edema any secretions boo job security slash boo bronchospasm inflammation loss of elasticity so you know it's not as specific to one of these but we know that the air resistance is trending higher and then based upon other th symptoms like uh, significant copious secretions, then we can sort of narrow it down uh, to what might be going on. All right, so those are that's the raw study, and I'll look at compliance study. So this one involves it's an invasive test, and so this one involves them swallowing an esophageal uh, transducer to sort of measure esophageal pressure as pleural pressure. Uh, and that's what we're going to sort of get that compliance of, the, of the, the, the lungs without having to intubate someone here. So this is putting something usually NG uh, uh, into their esophagus so that way we can measure it. So this is same thing with your lung compliance on a ventilator. We're looking at volume per unit of pressure, right? And we're going to see how compliant or how stiff the lungs are. We're going to use esophageal pressures instead of intubating them. Uh, esophageal pressures almost mirror exactly, almost mirror exactly intrapleural um, uh, pressures and therefore we know that the, the, the pleural pressure of the patient. So we can look at the volume of that their lungs change for the amount of pressure that of change there is and then we just do that division and we got their lung compliance. All right, so this is a, a gastric tube. So don't pay no attention that it's the GTO. I was trying to get it to be an esophageal balloon, but it's not. Um, so try not to pay too much attention to the picture. I was just trying to find a visual that would work, but I could not. Uh, the patient will swallow a balloon catheter. Notice they did, went through the nose here, which is usually where we'll have to go through here. Uh, and then it'll go about 10 centimeters into the esophagus. It is numbered. So you'll see at the nose, just like when you do NT suction or anything like that with an open suction, you'll have the numbers on it. So we'll insert it into the esophagus. It'll have a pressure transducer that sits at the end uh, there to measure how much pressure there is at the end of the catheter. And that pressure equates to pleural pressure, right? Then we'll have the patient do uh, various lung volumes with the PFT equipment, and we'll correlate it to the pressure change. And therefore, we get our lung compliance. Pretty straightforward. So mechanical, this is also not the, a picture of the compliance study, but he is swallowing a balloon, so that's a whole separate thing. Um, mechanical ventilator, we look at the peak of the plateau pressure, spontaneously breathing patient, 
um, we d we we have to use the esophageal uh, and the, the the esophageal as the pleural pressure, and therefore that's the pressure we're going to use over the volume that we're getting on the plethysmograph over usually the body box or whatever bedside thing we're doing it. So we're doing the same calculation, but we're using pleural pressure and volumes from the the plethysmograph or the bedside PFT machine. All right, so we're looking at volume and pressure when the shutter closes. So you need to do, you need to have a equipment that does have a shutter. So if you're making a list, and I would say it's wise of you to do so, of which PFTs require a closed shutter, this would be on that list. Like I say, hint, it would be wise of you to make a list of PFT uh, that use a closed shutter for the body box. Right. Um, so that's how we would measure non-invasively, but sort of invasively, <laughs> a lung compliance. They do have to swallow an esophageal balloon, but it doesn't involve intubation, so bonus. Uh, there's two transducers. One's looking at interpearl pressure, which looks is the one on the esophageal balloon. Now this is a picture of the esophageal balloon here. Right. And the other is the flow transducer that's measuring volume. That's the pneumotac from your equipment that is going to have that shutter that opens and closes during this. So normal values for lung compliance uh, for spontaneous, right? This is for spontaneous breathing patients, right? Not intubated, spontaneously breathing, no airways, no artificial airways, is 100 milliliters per centimeter of water, right? That's a normal spontaneous. Now, 80 to 120 percent of that would be considered within normal values, just like anything else PFT. Um, so their compliance will decrease in pulmonary edema, of course, uh, pneumonia, restrictive effect, pulmonary fibrosis, restrictive effect. Anything that decreases FRC would be something that would decrease your lung compliance, morbid obesity, right? Anything like that, third trimester pregnancy. Right, would decrease, not because of morbid obesity, the restriction of the abdomen against the lungs. Hopefully that got across. All right, but where you want to see it here, and you might actually see it increased, is something like emphysema, where we have chronic air trapping, right? If we're looking at a high level of emphysema, we might have chronic air trapping, and their, their lung compliance actually might be higher, over 120% of what's predicted and this is something that we can trend over time in the PFT lab if we do their compliance studies we can look at their elasticity right all right closing volume we're getting to the end of this whole thing <laughs> closing volume is in here for thoroughness sake I won't be too um, stressful on uh, interpreting or doing this procedure but it's still out there I still had a pulmonologist that would order a closing volume here and there and this is looking at gas distribution and so this is like a nitrogen washout where you're gonna give them oxygen and you can see airway obstruction early on uh, in this with a closing volume and so it's a single breath nitrogen washout which means you use 100% oxygen. Once again, you use 100% oxygen. Once again, you use 100% oxygen. Okay. So this one is looking at early closure of the lung. So after the lungs start closing up, right? You're looking at this graph here. Uh, look at the bottom left-hand graph where you're looking at TLC to residual volume. So this patient is exhaling. So you're looking at this graph here. Okay. This patient is exhaling. So they're exhaling, right? And the nitrogen concentration is increasing, right? As we get into the alveolar stage, that stage three is that alveolar stage. So that nitrogen concentration is increasing. And then we're going to see a sharp rise as the lungs continue to close. So once we start to see that change in direction, we start to see this little change in direction there. That's going to be where we're going to measure how much volume of gas, that's why it's a closing volume, how much volume of gas was contained in that period.
right? So that's looking at how much volume were they exhaling past the start of airway closure. That's why it's looking for early airway closure. So following the onset of airway closure, how much volume do they exhale? I'll repeat that again. Following the onset of airway closure, how much volume did they get out? How much volume did they exhale after the airway started to collapse? Right, so this can give the pulmonologist, this can give the interpreter a lot more detail about how severe or how early on their airway closure is and how functional they are with that airway closure. So we're going to get this curve, and this is what I was just talking about here. They're going to slowly inspire to 100% of 100% oxygen to TLC, right? To total lung capacity, they'll take a deep breath in. 100%, the air in the anatomical dead space is going to be mostly nitrogen, right? In the upper zones, the lower, lower, lower lung zones will get a greater portion of inspired oxygen. That's why you'll see it change. The result, less nitrogen in the lower zones. There's more in the upper zones. That's why you're going to see that nitrogen concentration increase as you start to see the alveoli empty, right? That's why you have the, a bigger uh, nitrogen concentration in phase three, which would be your, your, your respiratory area. And then this would be the start of the closure. And we're going to measure how much volume contained in that closure. So there's four phases. Phase one is just oxygen in the dead space, so you're not going to see a lot of nitrogen there, right, because we just inhaled most of it. So that's your extreme upper airway, your oropharynx, your laryngopharynx, all that stuff. Uh, as we get in phase two, we're looking at the remaining dead space gas, so we're looking at uh, trachea, mainstem, segmental bronchi, all the, those guys. Once you get into phase three, this is where the alveolar gas is exhaled. This is like when we look at the end tidal CO2, and don't confuse this with end tidal CO2. I'm just using it as an example. Remember, end tidal CO2 has a very similar graph where the exhaled gas of CO2 is very low, but as we get into the respiratory zone, it, it increases until we inhale again. That's when it would drop off. So that phase three of a end tidal CO2 waveform is the alveolar zone. Well, same thing here. This is your alveolar zone. Only on this one, you can see, okay, when is there a sharp rise? Well, from the point of that sharp rise to the point where they don't exhale anymore, I want to see how much volume they exhaled from the start of the airway closure. So I can tell how bad their air trapping is. Isn't that pretty cool? I thought it was cool. Um, so that's why phase four is that rapid increase when the airways uh, begin to close uh, and you're almost done with the alveolar gas. All right, and this is just a different picture of looking at it. And I took this one from, I believe, your Wilkins book, right? So this is where we have the onset of closing, right? You can see how we had that sudden acute change, right? And then we can sort of see when they're all the way empty, when they've exhaled the total lung capacity over here, this is their closing capacity. The volume from here to here, right? The volume from here to here is how much they could exhale past the start of closure. Well, let's say it happened over here. Oh heavens, it happened earlier on. Then their closing capacity would be increased, which is a bad sign, because that means there is more trapped gap. There's more air trapping. The onset of airway closures earlier in their exhaled cycle. I hope that makes sense to you. So the closing capacity is we're seeing how much volume they're exhaling past the start of airway closure. That can be, give us a sign of things like air trapping or the severity of it ultimately uh, early on. So what are normals? Uh, we're looking at percent of vital capacity. What percent? Uh, plus or minus 20% is normal. So that would be you can exhale 20% of your vital capacity after the start of airway closure. That's normal, right? If you, it will increase if you have small airways like emphysema, right? So this will increase if you have chronic uh, uncontrolled asthma, right? So anything that's that, that chronic air trapping type process, uh, you're going to have that increase in closing volume, which is a bad thing, right? So you should want roughly around 20%. More than that means we have more trapped gas. We have more um, 
early closures of the airway going on. So as you get older, of course, this is also going to increase. Yay, we lose elasticity and therefore the airways become more floppy, just like all of us with age. A little joke there. Uh, closing capacity uh, is calculated as, as closing volume plus residual volume. Uh, and that's how they calculate it. And I won't expect you to memorize that uh, for my class anyway, but uh, this isn't used much anymore. Uh, but I do want you to sort of understand that theory of understanding that we're trying to look at at what point of the exhaled breath are the airways starting to collapse. And if we can trend this, if we can sort of start to see this and quantify it on these patients, then we might be able to be more aggressive or might be able to look at prognosis or might be able to look at uh, different things that we can do to help them earlier on uh, rather than wait until things get severe. So I think it's good to know about, even though you may not perform it much, I think it's a good thing to think about because once again, my curiosity, just my own, would be, would there be something that we could do with this with mechanical ventilation, right? Could we give someone 100% oxygen and then do sort of a closing capacity and see airway closure and look at that in, in, in relation to elasticity as well as in relation to the, a patient's disease process? Right, that's how my brain sort of thinks of this. Hey, we're not using this in the PFT world, but we're seeing a trend, and that's why I'm big on this. We're seeing a trend toward mechanical ventilation turning into not only a therapeutic device, but also helping with a diagnostic device. So there is already a ventilator out there. A GE already has a ventilator that does an FRC. Not making it up, it does a modified FRC, it changes the FI2 by 10%, and it looks at their FRC. So I can do a lung recruitment maneuver, look at their FRC pre and post, and actually see the change in volume on my my uh, patient with a recruitment maneuver. I can show that it was effective. I can show we have better VQ match. I can show we have better surface area. So as we see these changes going on, I want you guys to understand this information will separate you from the pack. You're going to take this information to the next level. The future respiratory care is not now. You guys are the future, right? You're going to bring this, right? This is going to happen. And I don't want you guys to be left behind. So looking at stuff like this and applying it to critical care medicine will just bring you that much more um, closer to the evolution of respiratory care in a positive way. <laughs>